Merhabalar, hoş geldiniz. Sevgili arkadaşlar, meslektaşlar, okurlar. Efendim bugünkü panelimiz yayıncılık sektörüne global bir bakış. Bildiğiniz gibi Türkiye Yayıncılar Birliği Uluslararası Yayıncılar Birliği'nin üyesi. Bizim açımızdan tarihi de bir gün. Aynı zamanda üyesi olduğumuz örgütümüzün Türkiye Uluslararası Yayıncılar Birliği'nin Sevgili başkanı, dostumuz Hugo Sesler sağ yanımda. Sol yanımda da örgütümüzün genel sekreteri, dostumuz, arkadaşımız Jose Orgino burada. Onların İstanbul Kitap Fuarı'na gelip bizimle beraber açılışa katılmaları az önce bu salonda. Bizim sektörümüzdeki yayıncı arkadaşlarımızla tanışmaları fikir alışverişinde bulunmaları, sektörümüzün sorunlarını anlamaları ve kendilerinin başka ülkelerdeki deneyimlerinin bizlere aktarılmasını rica ettiğimizde bunu seve seve kabul ettiler. Öncelikle geldikleri için, ülkeye geldikleri için kendilerine çok teşekkür ediyoruz. Ben sorularımı soracağım, cevaplar alacağız her iki başkan ve genel sekreterimizden. Sizlerden de vakitimiz kalırsa da sizlerden de sizin de sorularınız olursa onlara da cevaplamaya çalışacaklar. Önce... Hugo'ya sorayım. Dünya yayıncılık endüstrisi nereye gidiyor? Son gelişmeler nelerdir? Bu konuyla ilgili bize biraz bilgi verebilir mi? Go. And well, I mentioned this morning at the opening that I think we're living exciting times. I think it's true for publishing as well. I have a very positive view of the future in publishing. Uh, I think there are more books being published every day. I think uh, technology is allowing publishers to expand into uh, further into different business models. Uh, publishers are uh, uh, almost all over the world publishing all, besides the traditional printed books, uh, e-books, uh, audio books, and experimenting with uh, new ways of bringing our, the content uh, from the authors to the readers. So we really have a lot ahead of us. Uh, I think it is very, uh, very positive for the future. Teşekkürler Hugo. Ee, bir başka soruyla bağlı sorayım. Teknolojik gelişmelerle nereye doğru gidiyoruz? Teknolojik gelişmeler ışığında yeni iş modelleri ortaya çıkıyor mu? Çıkıyorsa bunlar nelerdir? Nasıl hayata geçiyor? Bu konuda biraz daha bilgi verebilir misiniz bize? Yeah, perhaps I I started with the, with this question before a while ago, but yes, I think there uh, are a lot of ways in which we as publishers can now deliver our content in so many different ways and uh, if necessary in bits and pieces and and and the the, the um, the fact that now we can also have the uh, digital files of our contents available makes it possible to put those files uh, in, in different ways in different formats onto platforms and deliver these contents in many different ways to the readers i think um, publishers are still experimenting in, in many places around the world Uh, what are the best business models? Uh, we're still trying out the different business models, and there's really a lot uh, to be learned at this uh, at this moment. But technology definitely. Uh, sometimes we get questions if we think that technology is a threat, and I always like to answer that I see it more as uh, as an opportunity, as and not as much as a threat. I think it's really an opportunity for publishers. Also, audiobooks are on the rise uh, almost everywhere. So there's a lot being done in audiobooks as well. Şimdi Jose abi soru sorayım. Bütün bu teknolojik gelişmelerle birlikte telif hakları kavramı şu anda dünyada nasıl algılanıyor? Telif hakları ne anlama geliyor? Telif hakları ile ilgili bazı yeni gelişmeler ne olabilir? Bu teknolojik gelişmelerle beraber telif haklarında da bir dönüşüm var mı? Orada klasik anlamdaki bulduğumuz telif hakları anlaşmaları ya da telif haklarındaki taraflarda değişiklikler var mı? Ee, bu konuda biraz bize bilgi verebilir misin Jose? Alright, so copyright at the moment is under threat. 
um, the biggest companies ever to be walking the earth are now attacking copyright because it does not fit with their business model. The business model of publishers is to uh, create and then disseminate content and uh, working with authors and other people in the value chain of publishing to get as many people reading that content as possible. Um, the, the business model of, the, of these big tech companies, mainly based in America, is uh, nothing like that. What they do is they gather together other people's copyright, they gather together other people's work, and they make that available um, ostensibly for free um, to consumers, and uh, they attach advertising to it. So. Copyright is a threat to them um, because it stops them. It forces them to have to sometimes even pay uh, for their content. Th that's the situation at the moment. I, I think that um, uh, the perception of copyright, because these, these huge big tech companies do have a lot of money, they do have a lot of influence, um, they have uh, um, spread the word that um, information wants to be free. This is not true. Information doesn't want anything. Information is an abstract noun, and human beings create the content, and human beings need uh, to be paid for their work. So um, a lot of people are, t are tending to agree with the big tech companies, and that's a problem, because we have to convince them that copyright is actually the way that content is being created in the world. It's the way that content has been created for the last 500 years, and it's got us to the point where there is so much content out there, there is so much uh, highly valuable and highly diverse content, and to do away with copyright would actually threaten that content. Bu telif hakkındaki bu yeni gelişmeler, bu dijital e, büyük firmaların kuşatmalarıyla beraber yeni iş modelleri geliştirmesinde ne gibi zorluklarımız var? Yayıncılar bu yeni gelişmeler altında haklarını korumak için neler yapmalı, neye karşı uyanık olmalı? Buradaki iş modelleriyle ilgili bir şey varsa önce Jose cevaplasın, Bunu, bu konuda cevap vermesini istiyorum. Um, copyright is maybe 500 years old, but it's incredibly flexible. It allows for different types of usages. It allows for authors and other rights holders to work um, very subtly and very delicately uh, with what they create. They can give it away for free. They can license it at a certain rate for certain people in certain contexts. They can allow it to go into other uh, media like film and what have you. So I'm, I'm not convinced that copyright should be thrown out uh, right now. I think that it's uh, flexible and it will work with the new technologies. Uh, Ugo was talking about things like audio. Um, there is also um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, a whole bunch of new technologies that are coming along. And publishers are actually at the forefront of using those new technologies. And in the center of the whole system is copyright. So I'm not sure that there needs to be a new uh, concept. I think we just need to um, work it in a different way. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's uh, also important to, to mention that because uh, I was uh, uh, saying a moment ago that I'm very optimistic and positive about the future with the technology. And I am, uh, although I'm not naive, I know that there are challenges and that there are threats indeed also to protect our copyright. Uh, having a digital file makes it even more easy. Now it makes it much more easier for, for people to share those files and, and, and, and uh, uh, copyrighted protected files are being shared on social media, on WhatsApp, uh, what have you. 
so that's also a very important threat. We have to be aware. We have to work uh, locally with our authorities to make sure that our copyright is respected. Uh, the International Publishers Association is doing that on an international level, talking to policymakers, uh, trying to make sure that our copyright is protected uh, in those new platforms. Thank you very Belki biraz daha detay açalım diye düşünüyorum. Tekrar Jose'ye döneceğim. Bildiğiniz gibi yayıncılıkta farklı türleriniz var. Akademik yayıncılığımız, STM dediğimiz, eğitim, K12 dediğimiz, bizim fiction, non-fiction ve trade publishing dediğimiz alanlarda bu teknolojik gelişmelerden nasıl etkilendi hem telif hakkını korunması hem yeni iş modellerini geliştirme konusunda önlerinde engel var mı? Onlar nasıl etkilendi? Siz nasıl görüyorsunuz bütün bu alanlardaki dünyadaki gelişmeleri? The, the three tribes of uh, publishing are, um, as Kenan has outlined, uh, STM publishing, education publishing and trade publishing. So the um, uh, the, the three different tribes have three different business models and each one of them has been affected by and has utilized technological advancement over the last 30 to 40 years in a different way. STM publishing, scientific, technical and medical publishing, which is mainly academic and um, based around journals, um, is now almost 100% digital. It, uh, it delivers its content through to researchers and universities around the world in a digital uh, manner. And um, uh, researchers can go into separate um, articles, research articles, and click uh, on uh, links to other articles. Uh, the footnotes are completely cross-referenced. Uh, it is completely um, digital. Um, the, at the other end of the spectrum, trade is only now becoming more and more digitized, uh, but it's using digital as a second format, a different format, if you like, to the content that it produces on paper. So it's using it um, in a supplementary way, in a way that allows it to get into different devices and in different channels of distribution. So it's using digital as another format. In education, it's a little bit different. In education, uh, what publishers are trying to do is deliver content in a way that teachers can use in a classroom. So there's a constant um, feedback loop between publishers and teachers. Um, where the teachers are telling the publishers what they need in hard copy and what they need in uh, digital files and what they need in other types of delivery systems. So what we find in education is a kind of hybrid system using um, new technologies in a way that will allow a different kind of learning. But that requires that the, um, the schools are set up for us a different type of delivery. They have to be set up with uh, broad um, Wi-Fi and broad um, uh, connections to the internet. They have to have teachers that have been trained uh, in a different way of delivering the content. So it requires a, a total rethink of the way that teachers and students and publishers operate. Şimdi tam bu eğitim yayıncılığı kısmından ben devam edelim istiyorum. Şöyle, bizim ülkemizde olduğu gibi birçok ülkede de eğitim yayıncıları ile devletin arasında problemler var ya da yok. Devletler, hükümetler başka yerlerde kör kılımı planlarken bazen eğitimcilerle, öğretmenlerle, yayıncılarla konuşuyorlar. Bazı yerlerde konuşmuyorlar. Hatta bazen de approval sistemiyle de, onay sistemiyle de hangi kitapların okutulacağını hatta bazı yerlerde de devlet yayıncılığı hakim. Bizde de yüzde ellisi neredeyse devletin onayladığı. Türkiye'deki sistemle ilgili bilgi veriyor. Size sorumu öyle söyleyeyim. Türkiye'de bir ders kitabı yayınlanacağı zaman önce yayıncılar bakanlığa başvuruyorlar. Bakanlığın bir 
onay mekanizması var. O onay mekanizmasının onaylanırsa, iyi puan alırsa onaylanıyor ve ondan sonra da kitap okutulabilir hale geliyor. Buna benzer şekilde başka ülkelerde de benzer böyle bir onay sistemleri olabilir. Ve bu onay sistemleri içerisinde yayıncılarla devlet arasında hele hele teknolojinin geldiği yer itibariyle ne gibi dünyada zorluklar var? Bizde kitabın fiyatı neredeyse 30-35 sente kadar düşmüş durumda. Yayıncılara devlet devlet nasıl bakıyor? Başka ülkelerde eğitim yayıncılarının önündeki zorluklar nedir? Bütün bu teknolojik gelişmelerle beraber benzer şekilde onay sistemleri ya da sansüre benzeyen sistemler var mı? Bizde çünkü içeriğin de kontrol edildiği bir noktaya gelmiş durumda. Sansüre kadar da giden bir yapısı var. Acaba başka ülkelerde nasıl? Bu konuda Jose sen e, daha fazla deneyimin var eğitim yayıncıları ile ilgili. Bize bilgi verir misin? Okay. Um, we find, <coughs> excuse me, we find that the best performing education systems around the world have a few common denominators. Um, and one of them is that the uh, publishers, the education publishers in places like Finland, in uh, the Netherlands, um, in Germany, places where um, the PISA scores at the end of Uh, every few years, OECD brings out uh, a set of scores where it tests 15-year-olds in every country um, and tries to rank them. Um, we find that the PISA scores in countries like the ones I've just named are very high, regularly. And it's not just in Europe, it's also in places like Singapore, in uh, special places within China um, and in other um, usually um, uh, developed countries. And in those countries what we find is that the government works very closely with publishers um, and the publishers work very closely with teachers. So it's collaboration that means that the curriculum is transferred and, tra and translated into um, uh, content that is ready to be delivered within a classroom very quickly and very efficiently. The government trusts the publishers, the publishers trust the government, and the teachers work with both. So collaboration is central. The thing that comes out of, um, of that collaboration in those particular countries is a system whereby publishers publish books or resources in a kind of Uh, happy competition. They all compete against each other to produce the highest quality um, resources and the teachers choose the resources that best suit them in the classroom. So a teacher, if they're very good, if they're, if they're well trained, will know that a certain um, resource, a certain book will be better for their particular classroom. Uh, their classroom may be uh, at year five level, but they may be full of um, uh, children that have learning difficulties or come from um, uh, uh, broken families or, or from refugee uh, backgrounds. So that level will be different if the same teacher has another group of children in year five that are all uh, geniuses. Okay, so they will need to be able to choose the content and the type of uh, learning materials that best suits them. So choice is very important. Collaboration and choice. And finally, it's all about local solutions. Um, education has to be a local language delivery. So in many countries, um, uh, we find that if the stories, if the local stories are not being Um, uh, treated within the resources in the schools, then the students don't um, don't latch on. They don't. Um, uh, they're not enthused to come to school. So it's localization, choice, and collaboration. And you have those three things happening. Then the um, education publishers are part of the system that, d that delivers a high quality education. And it's not just publishers delivering a commodity 
to a school in the same way as a desk or a chair. What it is, is the publishers working with everything within the system to deliver high quality education for the students and ultimately for the country. Şimdi açıldı. Şimdi belki Hugo da aynı konuda bir şeyler söylemek isteyebilir. Yes, thank you. I would like to uh, highlight what uh, Jose just mentioned about uh, the importance of choice. I mean, the three things are uh, really critical. Uh, and uh, we usually like to give positive examples like the ones Jose was referring to. Uh, but let me also share with you a, a, a negative example, unfortunately, and it has to do with my own country in Mexico, where uh, Mexico has chosen for many years now to have the uh, uh, publishing industry completely excluded from the educational process in the first six years of, um, of the curricula. So the first six years, all, all the textbooks are done by the government, so there's no collaboration with publishers. They're done by the government. And the other problem is that, that there's only one single textbook per subject, which is, as mentioned, produced by the government. And the result uh, of all of that is that, that Mexico, and uh, Jose was mentioning, uh, the importance of also measuring things uh, and how countries who are doing well are also showing good results on the PISA scores. Mexico is on the very on the bottom of, uh, of, of all countries in, in the PISA results. And it has to do, it's all, of course multifactorial, it has to do with other things as well, it has to do with teachers, it has to do with other things, but it has to do with the lack of collaboration and the lack of uh, choice for teachers uh, and for students in Mexico. Ee, bunlar iki yıl önce PISA sınavlarındaki skorlarında en iyi olan üç ülkenin yayıncısını davet etmiştik buraya. Singapur, Estonya ve Finlandiya. Singapurlu yayıncı arkadaşımızın bize verdiği bilgi de aslında eğitimdeki meselenin iyi öğretmen başlangıçta onlar bağımsızlıklarını kazandıklarını önce iyi öğretmen yetiştirme ve burslarla sistemin içerisinde iyi öğretmen yetiştirme meselesini önemsediklerini birinci mesele haline getirdiklerini söylemişlerdi. İkinci kısmında yayıncıların kitap geliştirmesi konusunda öğretmenlerle çok sıkı iş birliği içerisinde olduklarını üçüncüsünde ise bu geliştirilen kitapların geliştirilen mevzuatla birlikte ne kadar başarılı olup olmadığını çıktılarına baktıklarını ve çeşitli zamanlar içerisinde tekrar gözden geçirerek mevzuatı da geliştirdikleri ve kitapları da geliştirdikleri ama öğretmenlerle eğitim bilimcileri ve vakanlık ortaklaşa çalıştıkları görülüyor. Şimdi bu skorlarda da söylendiğinde yukarıdakiler böyle bir yönetişim biçimi kavramı dediğin governance kavramı ile beraber çalışan ülkelerde bu işler gelişiyor ama biz doğruyu biliyoruz diye başlayan ülkelerde ise bu işler olmuyor. Arkadaşlarımızın verdiği bilgilerden de bunu anlıyorum ama burada acaba yayıncılık endüstrileri, yayıncılık endüstrisi hükümetlerle bu meseleleri konuşurken hangi dili ya da nasıl bir yaklaşım içinde olarak bütün bunları konuşmalılar? Yani onların dünyada gördükleri yapılar içerisinde hem telif hakları hem eğitim meselesinde geliştirilmesi meselesinde hükümetlerle görüşülmesi meselesinde bunların kavratılması ve yayıncıların işbirliğinin geliştirilmesinin neler oluyor deneyimlerinden yola çıkarak bize önerecekleri şeyler var mı? Ya da yayıncılara? Jose? Um, obviously um, you, Kenan and the um the Turkish Publishers Association know very well that uh, uh, discussing um, and negotiating with the government is a very delicate thing. Um, you can't go in uh, and tell them that they're wrong. Uh, you have to, in effect, gently introduce them to some facts um, and show that maybe in comparison to different ways of doing things, um, they might improve the situation. So it's always a, a matter of finding a, um, um, a gentle, um, respectful dialogue with the government, but also 
trying to introduce some facts. We found that in, in many cases, um, the local publishing industry um, uh, tells the government A, B, and C, and the government either rejects A, B, and C, or uh, tends to not listen. And then suddenly when the IPA, or the Education Publishers Forum, part of the IPA comes and tells the government A, B, and C, um, they tend to listen more because they think that the local publishers have, um, have a bias and have, um, uh, they've invested some, some um, well, money into their, their solution, so they mistrust their own publishers. And it's a matter of trying to show that there are different types of solutions. Often a government is trying to do the right thing. Often a government is trying to deliver uh, high quality education to its students because it wants to improve the situation within the country, uh, but it's also constrained by budget. And it thinks that what it's doing is um, the best result given a very tight budget. So we often try to explain um, to governments that in the long term, uh, it's better to go along with those, those um, uh, three ideas that I was talking about, choice, collaboration, and local solutions. It's best to go along with that and have a competitive market within the, the country for education resources, um, with publishers taking all the monetary risk the government just sets out the curriculum, makes sure that the publishers are delivering that curriculum, but allows those publishers to innovate, to keep on improving their resources, and ultimately improving the level and quality of education that each of their students get. <laughs> Hükümetler ya da bakan, eğitim bakanlıkları için ilgili değerlendirmeler yaparken bizim ülkelerde bazen bu içeriği her ne derse baskı basılan kitabın sayfa sayısı bu ve sayfaya göre bir maliyetlendirme meselesi noktasına geçiyorlar. Acaba dünyada bir şöyle bir korelasyon var mı? İçeriğin ve derinin değerlendirilmesi yani eğer ders kitabının bedelini devlet ödüyorsa, hükümet ödüyorsa başka ülkelerdeki o ödeme biçimleri nasıl bunu içerikten bağımsız değerlendiriyorlar mı? Yani bizdeki gibi sayfa sayısına göre de maliyetlerini ödemeye kalkıyorlar. Yoksa içeriğin bir değeri var mı? Bu, bunu şundan söylüyorum. Bir paralelliği var mı? Yani içeriği ödenen bedelle eğitimdeki çıktıların kalitesinin bir şeyi var mı, bir e, oraksı var mı? Daha ne sorma ama bir de bana tabii ki bozuyor. So you have to think strategically, long term. And often you need to invest a high amount early to be able to get to where you want to be. If you're investing small amounts um, up early, then chances are you will not move up that PISA score that we're all talking about. Um, in terms of how they measure um, the budget outcomes, uh, in different countries it's done in a different way. I don't know how it's done in Mexico, for instance, but I know that in many countries there's a tendering process. Um, you have to deliver a certain um, uh, resource for say year five mathematics uh, at a certain price. Um, and then in other countries, the government tries to take over the printing process. And we argue very strongly that publishers need to be in total control of the whole production process. And they will be able to get economies of scale operating in such a way that they can deliver high quality content even with a low um, uh, budget. Some countries um, deliver education uh, completely free. Other countries, it's up to the uh, parents or the students to buy um, the materials. Um, so the, the, all, the, all that the um, uh, government does is set the curriculum. 
all of those um, models can work, but um, we find that the models that work best in terms of the quality of the education are the ones where um, the demand side is much more uh, pronounced in terms of government um, involvement. So they help uh, parents, they help people to buy uh, high quality uh, resources. Whereas in the countries like uh, Hungary, for instance, where the government has nationalised education, is producing all the books itself and delivering them either free or very cheaply, the quality of those books goes down. And to go back to something that you were saying earlier, Kenan, one of the outcomes of a government um, education policy uh, taking control of the production of the resources is that you find that the government then has control of the propaganda that is being um, delivered to the students. So rather than having one, two, three, four different types of um, interpretation of history, you get the government's idea of what happened 20, 30, 50 years ago, and that becomes part of what everybody thinks. It's a, it's a, a kind of brainwashing. And ultimately what happens in those systems is that people um, who have the money um, abandon the state system. So you find that um, uh, non-government schools start to pop up everywhere. And those non-government non schools are able to afford better quality, uh, more diverse um, resources. And in, in effect, you've got a, a, a two-level um, education system. One education system that's better, and that's for rich people, and poorer people end up getting um, the worst type of education. So, cümleler bize ne kadar benzedi? Şimdi bizdeki yapı da ders kitaplarının iadesi yapılıyor. Bu yapılan ihalenin yarısını devletin hazırladığı kitaplar, yarısı özel sektörün hazırladığı kitaplar. Bizde de mesela uzun yıllardır şöyle bir kanaat vardı. Eğitimdeki başarının ya da eğitimle ilgili ihtiyaç olan her türlü kitabı devlet ürettiği için başka bir kaynağa gerek olmadan da bütün bunlar yapılabilir gibi bir genel bir kanaat vardı. Tam da devlet okullarıyla bizde de özel okullar var. Bu özel okullar yani bizde de orta sınıfın e, tam başlayıp e, daha e, yüksek gelir olan insanların da çocuklarını verdikleri okullar da var. Aralarındaki farkların içerisinde sadece eğitim meselesiyle değil biz orada şeyi de görüyoruz. Okuma kültürü açısından devletimiz bize şeyi söylüyordu. Yani okullara bir başka yayıncının kitap tanıtmaya ya da öykü ya da okuma kültürünü geliştirici kitaplar sokmasına gerek yok. Hatta yardımcı kaynak da sokmasına gerek yok denmesine rağmen bizde sektörün yüzde ellisi yardımcı kaynaklarla yürüyor sektör büyüklüğünde. Burada farkını da okuma kültürü meselesi açısından da bakıldığında özel okullardaki okuma kültürüne daha yatkın eğitim sistemi Üniversiteye giriş sınavlarında o kadar çok arayı açtı, açıyor ki tam da Hozen'in söylediği gibi e, bizde okuma kültüründen gelen çocuklar üniversite sınavlarında daha başarılı olup Türkiye'nin iyi üniversitelerine girebiliyor. Devlet okullarından gelen e, çocukların da okuma kültürü meselesindeki yürekli bir iki öğretmen dışındaki yerlerden gelenler daha gerilerdeki yerlere giriyor ya da üniversiteye girebiliyor. Şimdi bu okuma kültürü meselesi çok geniş bir alan ama belki Hugo'ya Okuma kültürünün hele bu teknolojik gelişmelerle insanların okuma alışkanlıklarını, eğilimlerini ve tercihlerini dünyada nasıl görüyorsunuz? Teknolojik gelişmeler ya da devletler bu okuma kültürünü geliştirmesini nasıl etkiliyor? Thank you, Kenan. I think that's also a very interesting question, and let me share with you perhaps a, a, a personal concern I have about that. Uh, and it has to do, and I, I quoted this morning, a book uh, by Marianne Wolf that it's, uh, the, uh, that's, that it's entitled Reader, Come Home, The Reading Brain 
in a digital world. Uh, so, and Marianne Wolf explains how how these uh, te how technology is affecting how the process of how we read that uh, children are starting to read only in short bits and pieces, uh, like uh, on social media, and we are kind of losing the capacity of deep reading, which is very important. And I, and I mention this because it's not only important for publishing, I think it's a very important question for our society. My young wolf, and there's a, a lot of other research, research as well, that proves that the brain is wired in a different way when we read. Uh, Marianne Wolf also mentions that, for example, uh, speaking is something that we have in our DNA. It's something natural. We learn to speak because we have it in our DNA. Whereas reading, we have to, we have to learn to read. It's not natural. It's something, an ability we have to learn, and especially not only to understand the different uh, words and the meaning of the different words, but to really be able to concentrate for a longer period of time in the text. And that wires the brain in a, in a different way than when you don't read. So what she suggests is uh, that we have really to have you know, with our children in schools, she suggests that by uh, literacy education, that means uh, the children learn not only to read on screen and, and short bits and pieces, but also to learn this deep reading, which by the way also has as a result, one of the very important results of, of the capacity of immersing in a novel, in a book of reading, of reading uh, uh, being able to spend an hour immersed in a book is that it uh, uh, enhances our capacity for empathy. We're kind of losing our, and we're seeing that with a lot of intolerance and with a lot of things happening in, in the world. And the way to, to gain again this capacity for empathy has to do with the uh, capacity, with our capacity of deep reading. And perhaps, uh, uh, and she makes the experiment, and, and I would ask right now, but perhaps uh, any one of you can, can ask yourselves uh, if it's not, if you haven't experienced lately also having some problems concentrating for longer periods of time, and a lot of people have answered that yes, it's been complicated because you get distracted. You're, you're starting to read and then suddenly uh, you get an email, you get a WhatsApp, and, and, and you're on to something else. And, um, and that's something, uh, uh, one of the things that I think as a society we have to be careful uh, for the future. Ogun'un dikkat çektiği şeyler gerçekten can yakıcı. Ben bir başka noktasına kayayım. Tek, tekrar Hugo'ya soracağım. Bütün bu bir şey de değiştirelim biraz, alan da değiştirelim. Erişilebilirlik, yani yayıncılıktaki şu andaki dünyadaki erişilebilirlik, çeşitlilik ve kapsayıcılık kavramları yayıncılık içerisinde artık sıklıkla çok konuşuluyor. Bunlar ne anlama geliyor? Yani engelliler, kadınlar... Ee, göçmenler, bütün bunlarla ilgili bu erişilebilirlik, çeşitlilik ve kapsayıcılık açısından e, neleri getiriyor, ne anlama geliyor, ne, ne anlamalıyız? O konuda bize biraz bilgi verir misin? Hugo. Um, thank you. Well, there's also a lot to cover. I'll try to not take too much time with this, but there's on the one hand, uh, it, it, it's all related, but on the one hand, let me start with diversity and, inc and inclusion. Uh, that's a very important topic for us right now at the International Publishers Association. Uh, we have a special envoy for diversity and inclusion, which is our uh, past, immediate past president, Michiel Coleman, who is working on different projects on uh, diversity and inclusion. And that means uh, a lot of things, not only in terms of gender balance, but also ethnicity and, and, and, and really bringing and being more open and more inclusive within our, publish, within our publishing houses uh, because it also brings better financial results and it's uh, also proven that a company which is more diverse and more inclusive uh, has also better financial outcomes. Uh, but also in terms of the things we publish, that it's important also, and there's a, an interesting initiative right now in the UK 
uh, also to uh, try to, uh, uh, publishers are trying to force themselves to publish also uh, books by, by other minority groups, perhaps, that are sometimes not very on the spotlight. So uh, they're trying to do that. And then there's the whole question of accessibility. And by accessibility, we don't, we don't mean that, our, that books are accessible in a way that they are uh, cheap, they're accessible in an economic way, but that they are accessible for people, especially with visual impairment. So there are a worldwide 253 million people with some kind of visual impairment that, has, uh, that have access to less than 10% of all the information that is published because it's not accessible for them. Uh, technology allows us nowadays to uh, produce especially our ebooks in a, in, a, in accessible format. Uh, and that is because there are there are uh, certain softwares that, that there is software that uh, visually impaired people use so that they can hear the text on a digital file. However, it's not enough just to have an ebook uh, like it is. Uh, we have to incorporate as publishers into our workflow uh, the characteristics of, of accessibility into our workflow. And it has to do basically with the notion that uh, visually impaired people could then navigate uh, in the book, that if you don't have those, uh, um, um, those tags incorporated into the books, you, uh, visually impaired people will have to start at the beginning and go all through the book until he finds what he's looking for. Uh, if the book is freely accessible, then that person can have access to the table of content and choose chapter five and go from page uh, 10 to page 150 and go back and, and so on and, and will be able to navigate in the book. There is a very important initiative and let me just finish with uh, uh, inviting you all as publishers to join the uh, Accessible Books Consortium. This is a very interesting initiative. You will find a lot of more information in a, on a web page, which is accessiblebooksconsortium.org. The Accessible Books Consortium is uh, a, a World Intellectual Property Organization initiative where a lot of other organizations are also uh, supporting, are a part of it, like IPA. And there is a charter for accessible publishing, where publishers commit uh, to making their works, uh, their, their publications, their books accessible. So I would uh, invite you to take a look at the web page. You can find the accessible uh, books, uh, the charter for accessible publishing there. And I would also invite you to sign the charter. There are, now we have reached um, uh, the number of 100 publishers who have signed the charter worldwide. Can, can I say something too? Hi. Um, th that, that's um, what, what Hugo has said is, is a, a very good summary of where we are. And um, what, what our um, uh, presidential envoy for <clears throat> diversity and inclusion has also said, and he said this at the uh, General Assembly of the IPA in Frankfurt, a couple of weeks back, <clears throat> is that uh, focusing on inclusivity, fo focusing on diversity, is the right thing to do. It's a moral question, okay? But putting that to one side, just ignore the moral question, the research shows that um, organisations that are more diverse are more successful. The more homogeneous an organisation, the less chance of it being successful, okay? Um, and a really obvious example of what I'm talking about is here. We're three men. And this morning at the opening, there were no men sitting at this table. There were, there were many women running around organising that event, and they were very good, and they got us and got all the men organised and on time, okay, but there were no women. There was a woman introducing the session, thank you very much, but that's part of organising, okay, and then there was a woman telling you about how she had organised the, the book fair. 
another organisational position. The men were talking about the big ideas, all right? Uh, what I would suggest is that ne that needs to change. One of the things that the IPA is trying to do very, very hard is to get more women to be part of our committees, more women to be part of our executive committee, so in the end we can be much more successful. Evet, Jose bizi utandırdı. Şimdi, Uluslararası Yayıncılar Birliği'nin sabahki konuşmasında Hugo, İnsan Hakları Evrensel Beyannamesi'nin yayıncılığın birinci temel dayandığı nokta, ikinci dayandığı nokta da telif hakları olduğunu söyledi. Tabii bu öyle kolay olmuyor. Dünyada düşünce ve ifade özgürlüğü ile ilgili birçok ihlal var. Sadece bizim ülkemizde değil, Mısır'da, Çin'de, Tayland'da, geçmiş yıllarda Kore'de. Şimdi Uluslararası Yayıncılar Birliği'nin yayınlama özgürlüğü ile ilgili Prix Voltaire ödülleri veriyor. Hatırlayacaksınız bu Prix Voltaire ödüllerini geçmişte sevgili yayıncı abimiz Ragıp Zarakoğlu, iki yıl önce de sevgili arkadaşım Evrensel Yayın Evi'nin yöneticisi Cavit Naci Tayhan, o da burada aramızda. Hem de Cumhuriyet Kitap Ekimi'nin yayın yönetmeni Turan Günay e, aday olmuştu ve İPA onları bu Prix Voltaire Komitesi Düşünce İfade Özgürlüğü ödüllüğüne ödüllendirdi ve bir nevi de dayanışma içinde oldu. İPA'nın bu anlamdaki çalışmaları nın yayınlama özgürlüğü ile ilgili durum nedir dünyada ve bu dünya bu konularda nereye geldi bu konuyla ilgili başkanımız Hugo bize tekrar biraz bilgi verebilir misin Hugo? Uh, thank you Kenan and that's uh, really a very important topic for us uh, at the International Publishers Association because as we men as I was mentioning this morning as Kenan was explaining uh, our two main subjects are uh, protection of copyright and the freedom to publish and uh, even with the best copyright protection um, it doesn't help when you're not free to publish when you're threatened to being imprisoned or or or or, or persecuted or or even killed in some parts of the world so um, the best copyright protection doesn't help in that case uh, so freedom to publish is really important that's why uh, uh, also Kenan was explaining about our pre-voltaire which is a an award we, uh, as IPA, give every year. I'm very glad that uh, two of the recipients are, well, the, the daughter of, of, uh, of one of them, of uh, Turhan Gina, is uh, right now with us. Um, so, and it's, it's really an important thing. And we have noticed and we have seen, unfortunately, uh, problems for the freedom to publish in many places around the world, and it's uh, kind of getting worse. One of the things we were discussing here as well is an increasing self-censorship, and the problem with self-censorship is that when you are starting to get afraid of uh, being uh, uh, persecuted or, or threatened uh, because of what you publish, you censor yourself, you st stop publishing certain things because of the fear that you might be threatened or, or that something might happen to you. That's, that's a problem of self-censorship. And in that case, in that sense, it is also being uh, fueled, I mean, social media is a great thing for many things, but it's also, it can also be a danger in the sense that there are many authors and publishers also being harassed by, on social media because of things they have uh, expressed or published. Uh, and then turn to self-censorship, and that is a, a problem. And we see problems around uh, censorship and self-censorship in many places around the world. I sometimes mention even that, uh, I mentioned this morning, um, the problems we have in Mexico with a lot of, uh, unfortunately, journalists being murdered. Uh, Mexico is considered, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the, the, the, mo the most dangerous country uh, not currently in a war zone for, for journalists. And there is, but there are also problems in countries where perhaps one might have thought that there are really uh, free to express and so on. And, and, and we saw only recently that the president of one of the most powerful countries in the world was trying to stop the publication of a book. The pre president Trump in the US was trying to stop the publication of a book. And we were also supporting our members there and the, the, the publisher of that book 
And, and we see those trends in, in, in, in many countries, uh, unfortunately, all over the world. So we feel that it's also our duty as International Publishers Association to stand by the publishers who are being threatened, harassed, who are being intimidated, uh, to bring them support and to be there with them and to show them this uh, support, to talk to governments about the importance of freedom of expression and freedom to publish. Bu konuda ben İPAN'ın yaptığı çalışmaları biliyorum. Bizim de Türkiye Yayıncılar Birliği olarak 1995'ten beri yayınlama ve ifade özgürlüğü ile ilgili raporlarımız, ödüllerimiz var. Her yıl diyoruz ki bir dahaki yıl inşallah vermeyiz, inşallah rapor düzenlemeyiz ama ne yazık ki devam ediyor. Ee, etkinlik süremizi tamamlamak üzereyiz ama ben belki başkana son bir çağrısı olabilir diye bir şeyi söylemek istiyorum. Uluslararası Yayıncılar Birliği iki yılda bir kongre yapıyor. Yayıncılık sektörünün çeşitli alanlarından konuları konuşuluyor, tartışılıyor. Oraya sektörün içerisindeki çok önemli aktörler, fikri olanlar, sunumları oluyor. Ee, önümüzdeki yıl, 2020'de 33. Uluslararası Yayıncılar Kongresi Norveç'te Lillehammer'da olacak. O da düzenlenecek olan Kongrede neler konuşulacak, bağımsız olarak yayıncılar oraya gelmesinde, yayıncıların oraya gelmesine fayda var mı? Bunu Başkan Ugo'ya sorayım, bize o kongreyle de ilgili bilgi versin. Um, thank you for for mentioning that, Kenan. Uh, yes, that is very important. That's a very important uh, activity for publishers. The uh, IPA was actually when it was founded in 1896. It was founded as the International Publishers Congress. It was the first name the International Publishers Association had 123 years ago. So it started with a Congress, and we have been having those Congresses ever since. Uh, and uh, nowadays they're being held, as Kenan mentioned, every two years. And that's really a unique opportunity to bring publishers together from all around the world to discuss uh, current problems we have and we share in many of our, country, uh, in many of our countries to get to know also uh, what are the uh, challenges and opportunities in different countries. In this Congress in, in Lillehamma in Norway, it will be the 28th to the 30th of May next year in Lillehamma. Uh, you can find more information on IPA's webpage that will link you to the uh, Congress webpage as well. Um, and the um, registration is open now, and there's an early bird fee that is valid until the end of November, if you're interested. And so we will be discussing, uh, well, all the topics which are important to us as publishers. And then one of the days, one of the two days of the Congress, we will have something also very interest interesting. We will have two tracks, one track for educational publishers, so it will be all focused on educational, and one for trade publishers. Um, uh, and we will be, of course, discussing all other uh, I, uh, all other subjects that are important for publishers as well. So uh, it's a great opportunity to meet people from, to meet fellow publishers uh, from uh, other countries to work together. As I was mentioning this morning, I've been talking about building bridges between countries, and, and that's one of the best ways to do that by attending such a Congress. So we uh, hope to see you there. Çok teşekkür ederiz Hugo. Üç dakikamız var. Soru sormak isteyen arkadaşımız varsa bir soru alabiliriz. Yoksa ben Jose'ye bir soru soracağım. Buyur. Mikrofon getirecekler Alfat. Merhabalar. Ben şeyle ilgili bir soru sormak istiyorum. Bu internetin ve teknolojinin gelişmesiyle birlikte bilgi ortamları da değişiyor, sürekli değişiyor. Telif hakları konusu da aslında yasalarla güvence altına alınmış durumda ama sürekli değişen bu teknolojik ortama ne kadar uyum sağlayabiliyor? Bu da aslında o bilgi üreten açısından bir sorun e, ortaya koyuyor. 
Ee, bir örnek vereyim mesela e, diyelim ki çok e, meşhur bir kişi e, yüz binlerce kişi takip ediyor. Diyelim ki İstanbul'un e, trafiği ile ilgili hani ne düşünüyorsunuz diye bir tweet attı. Bu tweet'i de e, binlerce kişi düşüncelerini e, yazıyor. Ben de kişi olarak oradan beğendiğim 200 kişinin düşüncesini aldım. Bunu kitap olarak bastım. Yani bunun tehlif haklarını ben o insanlara nasıl şey yapacağım? Yani o iki kişiye nasıl ulaşacağım? Bunun tehlif hakları nasıldır? Bu tür yeni sorunlar ortaya çıkıyor. Bu konuda düşüncelerini öğrenmek istiyorum. Sanki Jose cevap verebilir gibi. Um, my understanding of what Twitter does is it removes everybody's copyright. So what the big tech companies do is say If you use our technology, you don't have any rights. Finished. E, vakit doldu ama var mı başka sorusu olan? Son bir soru alalım. Ben şöyle bir soru sormak istiyorum. E, dünya çapında korsanla mücadele de Sizce en etkili yöntem nedir? Yani Türkiye'de bunun uygulanabilirliği nasıldır? Bunu kime soruyorsunuz? Kime? Bugur. Bugur. Well, yes, uh, piracy is something we face also all over the world. We were uh, when we were discussing earlier copyright, we were discussing more um, uh, policy issues, but it's true that one of the problems we face all over the world has to do with piracy, and uh, we have to work with our governments with that. In order to be able to really enforce copyright, we have to be able to work with our governments. Otherwise, uh, uh, strategy won't work if we don't work together with our governments. There are uh, certain examples, like I think the case of the UK, if I'm not mistaken, where um, uh, publishers worked uh, very successfully together with their governments uh, in order to, to, to really enforce copyright. Uh, then there's a problem if we don't work with the governments, if they don't understand the value of copyright, that one of the things that happens sometimes with us in, in, in Mexico is that we go to our government and say, well, this is happening. And one of the answers we have had, I mean, it's not always the case, but one of the answers we have had, and something that can happen also, is that uh, authorities might say, well, you know, uh, they have to make a living, so uh, uh, we, we, we cannot go against those people because they're just trying to make a living and, and, and we have to let them do that. And, and then, well, as much as we try to say, well, it, but it, it's illegal. Um, but well, it's, it's some of the things that can happen. So our uh, working and talking to our governments is really important for that. E, bir iki cümle de ben edeyim. Şimdi yayıncılık endüstrisinin hükümetlere nezdindeki telif haklarına ihtiyacı meselesini ne kadar doğru anlatırsa o kadar yol alma şansı var. Ben 1986'lardan 2004'lere kadar bu alanda çok emek harcamış, çok çaba harcamış bir arkadaşınız olarak 2004 yılında çıkan telif hakları yasasında korsan yayıncılığın bir kamu suçu olduğu kararının yasallaşmasıyla beraber polisin, zabıtanın ve herkesin resen sorumlu olduğu bundan e, önleme ile ilgili savcıların bir şikayete bağlı suç olmaktan çıkartıp dava açabileceğini maddeye yazdırdığımız gün Türkiye yayıncılık endüstrisinin gelişeceğini biliyorduk. Fakat bu bizim beklediğimiz 3-4 yıl içinde hani herkes bu görev alarak onu anlayacak, polis, savcılar, hakimler anlayacak ve mesele çözülecek sanıyorduk. Öyle değil. Gene Yaptığımız çalışmalarla e, bu kamu suçu olmayan şeyin takibini kimin yapacağı meselesi çok karışıktı. Onun üzerine kültür komisyonları kuruldu. O kültür komisyonların başına polisin ten, emniyetten birinin geçirilerek kolluk kuvvetleri olarak baskınlar yapılmaya başladığında o zaman işte yol almaya başladı. 10 yıl sürdü. Şimdi bugün bütün bunların başarıya ulaşması ile ilgili yayıncılık endüstrisinin sorunlara sahip çıkıp Devletle de hükümetle de bu meselelerin üzerine gitmesiyle olur. Buradaki meselelerden bir tanesi 
özellikle yasa dışı fotokopi meselesinde kamu vicdanında suç değil. Mesela bununla uğraşmak, bununla ilgili lobi faaliyeti yapmak, eğitim çalışmaları yapmak çok uzun bir zaman bunu yapmak zorunda kalacağız. Ama kolay da değil bu işler. Bir de dijital korsanlıkla da beraber şimdi yeni bir yasa geliyor. Umarız ki istediğimiz şekilde olacak. Bak bir şey söyleyeyim, öyle kapatayım. 10 yıldır yeni bir yasa taslağını tartışıyoruz. Bu yasa taslağının 42 maddesinde yayıncılar hep bir takım öneriler sundu, tartıştı, konuştu, yazarlarla ortaklaştırdı, yayıncı örgütleri kendi aralarında tartışarak konuştular. 10 yıl içinde geldiğimiz nokta ne oldu biliyor musunuz? 42 maddenin 39 maddesi bakanlık bürokrasisi tarafından kabul edildi. Çok önemli bir başarı. Ama 10 yıl sürdü bu. Şimdi o yasa çıkacak, o yasanın uygulaması ile ilgili tekrar kolları sıvayacağız ve devam edeceğiz. Ama esas olarak ürettiğiniz içeriğin çoğaltılması, yayılması meselesinde önemli görevler düşüyor. Herkese düşüyor. Ama başta yayıncılara düşüyor. Ben burada toplantıyı kapatacağım. Hem çok uzaklardan gelen başkanımız bir şey mi? Can I just, I, since you were going to, to thank, I would also like to thank, excuse me for just taking the microphone, but I just wanted to thank you, Kenan, for inviting us not only to the book fair, but for organizing and inviting us to this uh, panel. I hope it was useful for everyone, so thank you very much for that. And thank you for our excellent interpreter as well. I'd like to thank the interpreter as well. She's fantastic. And talking about the culture of distraction, uh, I've been watching her, and it's like she's conducting an orchestra back there, or maybe dancing. She's fabulous. Thank you. Ee, aslında bu türlü toplantılarda en önemli görevler buradaki konuşan insanlardan ziyade bizim simitone olarak bu çevirileri yapan arkadaşlarımıza çok müteşekkiriz. Ben de bir yandan kulaklığımdan dinlerken de mümkün mertebe yavaş konuşmaya çalıştık. Umarız e, istediğiniz gibi olmuştur ama çok teşekkür ediyorum çünkü bütün kavramlar ve e, kültürel kavramların çok doğru çevrilmesi gerekiyordu. Ben de çevirmenimize çok teşekkür ediyorum. Geldiğiniz için önce Hugo'ya ve Jose'ye çok minnetle teşekkür ediyorum. Çok çok uzaklardan geldiler. Sizlerin de gelip dinlediğiniz için herkese çok teşekkür ediyorum. Sağ olun, var olun.